World Football in association with Western Union Money Transfer. On the comeback trail in England's northeast, this week on World Football, Spanish superstar Guy Scamendieta on life in Middlesbrough. In search of the next Harry Kuehl, Australian football looks to the future, but can it unearth the next generation of Socceroos? And America's German connection, Blau Weisskotschi, celebrating 50 years of the round ball game in New York. Long ago, he was amongst the game's hottest properties. He helped inspire Valencia to undreamed of glory. Soon he was on his way to Serie A for a mind-boggling $45 million. But then, things went wrong. Time for a comeback, and Gaish Gomendieta is back. With a vengeance. He may be a Basque, but Mendieta made his name in the Fiesta city of Valencia. Signing for Los Ches in 1992, he became club captain, the beating heart in midfield. Not bad for someone who at first struggled to find his natural position. I started playing in the middle of the park in midfield, but when I joined Valencia they put me in defence. When the new coach arrived they put me back in midfield because I wasn't a defender. I'd never played as a defender, always a midfielder. Where Mendieta led from the front, Valencia was suddenly challenging for the biggest prizes. They became genuine title contenders and a major force in Europe. There was more to Spanish football now than just Real Madrid and Barcelona. They reached the Champions League final in two successive years, losing on both occasions. Well, in life there are good and bad moments, and those were probably the worst. At the time you aren't aware that you're playing in the final of the Champions League. At that moment all you want to do is win it, and we couldn't do that. In the summer of 2001 he swapped the Primera Liga for Serie A. Lazio paid 45 million dollars, money that bought neither party happiness. Indifferent team performances saw the departure of Lazio coach Dino Zoff. Mendieta found himself relegated to the bench. Trying to reclaim his position on the pitch became mission impossible. Rome never felt like home. In Italy they live football in a very special manner. They live football very passionately, more than in Spain. This makes the good and the bad moments more extreme, and the fans make it obvious, as do the press. So I think it's either very good or very bad for people. There's no in-between. With no future at the Stadio Olimpico, Mendieta moved to Barcelona on loan for a year. When his Catalan adventure ended in the summer, he surprised everybody by turning his back on both Italy and Spain to join unfashionable Middlesbrough. Well, he had a fantastic reputation. He was at Valencia. He was one of the most sought-after players in Europe. And then, for some reason or other, things never worked out for him. And he had a bar in a couple of years, which is, which is good news for Middlesbrough Football Club. And yes, you've got to say it was a bit of a surprise, but it's one that's delighted all the Teesside fans. After an unsettled time in Italy and Catalonia, his reason for heading to Middlesbrough was simple. Principalmente. <laughs> Essentially, the reasons why I came here were because I was excited about playing in the Premiership and also the fact that Steve McLaren came to Rome to speak to me. To me, that demonstrated the interest of the club for me, a club that is working hard to be amongst the best in England. Mendieta is getting back to his best, but the team is struggling. With only eight points from ten games, Middlesbrough find themselves near the drop zone. 
and the fans fear this will jeopardize their chances of signing their new Spanish hero full time. He's playing brilliant. Couldn't possibly say how much he's worth to us at the minute. He's the sort of person we need this season. It's the same old story, isn't it, with Middlesbrough Football Club? It's the same old thing, you know. <laughs> they spend all this money all the time and then they're still just mediocre in the middle. It's just how well we play, because you don't want to play in a team who struggle. It's like, if we don't do well this season, someone who's a top team is just going to say, right, we'll have him. But there's hope. Barra have offered a four-year contract. And Vendietta is seriously contemplating signing it. At the moment, I'm happy here at Middlesbrough. And the idea, both mine and the club's, is for me to stay here for five years and to try and achieve the objectives we set out at the beginning. It was a sudden and unexpected fall from grace, an experience that's left him older and wiser. Gaish Kamendieta is back, working to restore a formidable reputation. I think football brings you good things as well as some not so good. But everything is useful and you must learn from everything. I wished everything was good, but it isn't always like that. The name is Blau Vice Gotchi. Blau Vice are the colours the Gotchia teams have always worn. These were originally the colours of the Gotchia region of Central Europe. In the 1940s, there was a wave of emigration to New York City from the German speaking Gotchia area, now part of Slovenia. And in a place where the people of the world gathered, they would naturally enough get together to play football. Here you have everything, here's a melting pot. You have from all over Europe, Africa, Asia, South America, Central America, everybody here plays soccer. And you can go to all different, any, any park like you see here and you'll see people kicking the ball. But then there are a lot of people bouncing the ball around in the Big Apple. It's taken some time for football to break through the traditional sports of the USA. And the key to growth has always been found in those international communities. The Gotchi immigrants settled mainly in the borough of Queens where they made the Ridgewood area as Germanic as any in the five boroughs. Bern Bohem has been involved with the club for nearly 40 years. The actual beginning of the club is in 1951. And it was done primarily just to keep the ethnic group going. And for about the first 10 years, they had tremendous youth teams. In fact, from I think 1969 to 75, we won the State Cup consecutively seven years in a row. Bernd helped develop the Gotchi youth sides, putting in phenomenal hours on top of his full-time teaching job. But while the club have brought back many honours to Queens, it hasn't all been about winning. The winning is a byproduct. It's not a question of winning, it's a question of with what style. And our club is known basically as, as probably one of the most skillful clubs uh, on the whole East Coast. More than collecting trophies and playing the game, Bernd and the Gotchi Club have concentrated too on the overall well-being of the youngsters. It's been their main focus for over half a century. The best memories are actually seeing some of the younger players either do well uh, in soccer, do well in life, and also come back and give it their time. For me, I, I respect that tremendously. I played in this league and I played for Gachi uh, when I was a junior and um, I feel that soccer has given me a lot and uh, the league has given me a lot. It's given me the opportunity to, to meet people, to travel around the world and I feel that you know I want to give back to soccer. I don't do it for money, I just do it because I love the game. While Blau Weiss have flown the German flag, over the years they face formidable competition from other international communities right across New York City. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. You would have the Greek Americans, you'd have the Ukrainian soccer club, Hellenic, which was another Greek team, uh, Bonitol, which was a Romanian team. You had every variety of, of ethnic team around. The Gotchia community in Queens is now less concentrated than it was 50 years ago. As a result, the club have evolved into a more international setup. Milton Espinoza, an Ecuadorian, now looks after BW's links with New York's Cosmopolitan League. You look at our teams, uh, we have kids from all over the world. Some of them were born there, 
most of them now, which is good for us, are born here. So they're growing up with the cane. And we don't have to rely on the kids coming from abroad. And that's, that's good for us for the game. Still, B.W. Gotchi is a club that retains a strong identity. Milton's son played for Gotchi and is now a coach. There's a great sense of pride in wearing, actually, the jersey for Blauweiss. Okay, kids take a great deal of pride in, in representing Gotchi. All the players know each other, the coaches help one another out across the different age groups. So it really becomes a family affair and, and makes it something special. So if B.W. Gotchi are a family, there's no doubting who's the father. And after 40 years, Bernd Bohem is looking to the future with a paternal eye. We're expanding and it's very important that we get younger people. My time has passed. The younger people have to get involved. They have to enjoy it and just carry on. That's my dream where we have children constantly playing soccer. Good. Good idea, Josh. Still to come, looking to the future. Australia's difficulties in producing another Harry Kuehl. And fighting for equality, Colombian footballer turned politician, Wellington Ortiz. But first, a question. Gaisca Mendieta may be starring for Middlesbrough, but he remains a Lazio player. Who coached the Roman club to the last Scudetto three years ago? The answer, after the break. Welcome back. Before the break, we asked you who had led Gaius Commendiator's club Lazio to their last Scudetto. Well, the answer, of course, England coach Sven Goran Eriksson. It was only their second championship triumph. This patch of grass in Sydney may look like any other Australian park. And these youngsters practicing their skills are probably unaware of its significance. But this is where one of Australian soccer's hottest talents was discovered. The young Harry Kuehl was spotted and snapped up by English Premiership side Leeds United. At Ellen Road, he developed into the first Australian football superstar. This summer saw him complete a big money move to Liverpool. But fulfilling that boyhood dream wasn't all plain sailing for the boy from the Sydney suburbs. Sacrifices have had to be made. He's had it's a lot of strain, a lot of pain, but as you say, the rewards are there. The rewards are massive, as 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 people know. And I mean, but as you say, there is a, another side to it. I mean, there's family. I mean, I miss my kids a lot. I miss my wife a lot. And you know, you don't get a lot of time to relax. There's a lot of people wanting your time, and that you always got to be nice. I mean, if, if you be bad, people are just always going to bag you and that. So. There's certain things comes with it, but as you say, there are other great things that come with it as well. Kuehl started out on the road to fame at the National Talent Identification Championships. This competition is held annually, attracting teams from across Australia. For the players, it's a chance to impress the watching scouts. An opportunity of following in Kuehl's footsteps. The breeding ground for, for a play like Harry is, is definitely here and like I said I think we'll get more than one coming through in the next few years and uh, I've got no doubt that uh, I think over the next five or ten years uh, you'll see that uh, you know, Harry was the first of, of many that we've produced. But new FIFA rules restricting young players moving overseas have meant that developing tomorrow's stars will not be as easy as it was. In the past many Australians moved to European clubs at a tender age. Now the onus is on the Aussie system. I moved away from my family when I was 15 years old to the other side of the world, so it was a big step. And if people are prepared to do that, well, as you say, I mean, it's like in any job. If you're prepared to work for anything, you know, the rewards are there. For Australian youngsters, achieving those rewards now means being part of the country's elite development squad. They can't sign for European clubs, so to gain experience, these teenagers regularly travel to compete against the best in Europe. 
Uh, with the Institute, we had a three-week tour of Holland, Germany and Europe, where we had a chance to play with the top teams, such as Feyenoord, Ajax, PSV and Borussia Dortmund, and we played their junior level, and we did very well against them. It was fantastic to taste a different style of football and know what you're up against and what the same boys our age over there are up to. And it makes you realise how hard you have to work because they're very gifted players over there and yeah, it gives you a real insight into where you want to be in the future. In the search for the next Harry Kewell, hope is on the horizon. Having suffered financial problems, Soccer Australia now has a new boss and a new structure. Its major priority is the organisation of a youth development scheme. Others fear it is too little, too late. It, it's a well that's run dry because we didn't implement a structure uh, of any quality similar to the Clayfontaine system which the French developed 20 odd years ago with Gerard Houllier you know, and those people. Uh, basically that system works. It is continually producing the best players in the world. The implementation of the new scheme will prove crucial to the future of Australian football. If it fails, one of the world's top sporting nations may have little to shout about when it comes to soccer. I'm quite sure you can uh, continue your development in Australia because as you say there's some great players that are coming out of Australia. I know maybe once they get to a certain age you've got a, got a drift across to Europe because as you say I mean Europe you know it's just the number one sport there. Everyone plays it, everyone lives for it and it's where the best people are playing. If we get our National League right then I think uh, there's no doubt we'll keep kids here until they're you know, 19, 20, 21 and then they'll make their move overseas and I think that'll be good for, for both sides. The Principality of Monaco, not the likeliest setting for a thriving club, but Monaco are part of French football's aristocracy, and in the 90s they were a team to fear. By 2000, they were on the brink of a seventh title. Up front they had the striking power of French star David Trezeguet and Italy's Marco Simoni. And in April of 2000, a point against unfancied Nancy would clinch Monaco le championnat. But things didn't start well for the home team. Nervous and edgy, Nancy's defender Olivier Rambo then found himself some space. His header looped over the stranded Fabian Barthez. A goal for Rambo, first blood Nancy. Monaco needed someone to help them raise their game. Simone was just that man. The Italian controlled John Arnarisa's cross to slot past Bertrand Lacroix. 1 1. Still in the first half, and Nancy again took the lead. Fabien Lefebvre with the simplest of tap ins after Barthez made a hash of the corner. The French number one wasn't having a good day. But Monaco responded. A fierce drive hit the upright. And with only minutes remaining, Dada Perso bundled Simone's cross home for only his second goal of the season. 2 2. Relief for Monaco. Despair for Nancy. Inferior goal difference would see them relegated. But the Principality could celebrate. 20 plus goals from both Trezeguet and Simone helped them to that seventh title. This season, Monaco are again in the hunt, coached by a French legend, Didier Deschamps. They're part of the elite again and strong contenders to win another title. But they've a tough act to follow. His name has become synonymous for outstanding achievements in two separate worlds. In Colombia, he's become a national treasure. He achieved fame as a footballer, but perhaps more importantly, he's also earned nationwide respect as a politician. For two decades in the 1970s and 80s, Willington Ortiz starred as a prolific club striker for Millonarios, Deportivo Cali and America. His fame made him a household name. When his football career ended in 1988, 
he decided to put his celebrity to good use. He would run for office. His cause celeb, the rights of the black community. Every time you went out in your hometown, you were recognized as a sportsman. You were always asked to help the community. At the same time, as a sportsman, I used to tell people not to ask me. I wasn't the right person to ask. They should go to politicians. How times have changed for one of Colombia's top goal scorers. The former tennis hero, now a member of parliament and a highly regarded political activist. Now in this political role that I have, I can help the community. This is what interests me most now, what concerns me now. I want to improve my community's situation. Willie Ortiz began his football career with Millonarios in 1971. A goal on his debut was just the start of an outstanding spell that saw him win two championships in the 70s. His playing days may well be behind him, but today's Millonarios fans are well aware of his legacy. Willie Ortiz scored 174 goals. They're the club I owe most to, because it was the club that gave me the opportunity to make my debut. They gave me the chance, so I'm very grateful to them. In 1980, he joined Deportivo Cali and was named man of the tournament in the 1981 Copa Libertadores. But soon he transferred to Rivals America. There he won four league championships and was a three-time runner-up in the Libertadores. But domestic success wasn't translated onto the world stage. Colombia failed to qualify for a World Cup between 1962 and 1990, a fact that still haunts him. I wanted to know how good I really was and help make the people of my country proud of me. Could I have made it on the world stage? I still ask myself that question. But there was no doubting his impact on Colombia's political culture. Black rights leaders are full of admiration for Willington's political advocacy. Willington has confronted and continues to confront a whole political mindset which in the past has left us with a very negative legacy because of corruption and everything else that goes on in Congress. My dream is for black people to get more opportunities. I dream that all their needs that they currently have can be met. I dream that they get more education in order to compete on a level footing, to gain access to better facilities. Thanks to Willington, youngsters are already getting those opportunities. The end of his playing career saw the start of the Willington Ortiz Football School and a chance for juniors to train for professional contracts. He may have swapped the changing rooms for smoke-filled rooms, but his relationship with the people remains unaffected. No, It hasn't really changed, because I'm not treated like a congressman. People still continue to call me simply Willie. The goalposts have certainly moved, but Willington Ortiz remains committed to the cause a natural-born leader both on and off the field. <laughs> 37 and still going strong. Next week on World Football, one of English football's superstars, the evergreen Teddy Sheringham. See you next week. World Football in association with Western Union Money Transfer.